we are having on our audience. Great scientists understand that great science is only appreciated when it's presented well. And that's why I want to remind you of all of these Nobel Prize winners who spent so much time on learning to speak well in public so that their ideas and concepts would be appreciated. And in fact, maybe that's why their ideas were appreciated, because they took this time to learn how to present their science well. Here's another professor uh, here at Berkeley who was talking about Feynman. But even though, even when he thought he was explaining things to freshmen and sophomores, it was not always really they who benefited most from what he was doing. It was more often us, scientists, physicists, and professors, who would be the main beneficiaries of his magnificent achievement, which was nothing less than to see all of physics with fresh eyes. Lots of other scientists and teachers watched his lectures. Oppenheimer is another great example of a scientific presenter because Oppenheimer, again, the atomic bomb, right? Three times nom uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize. Oppenheimer, uh, in his early career, was a terrible, terrible speaker. When he first began teaching at Berkeley in 29, he had uh, 60 students join his class, and at the end of the semester, only one survived. <laughs> only one was still in his class. He was just an awful speaker. He didn't seem to be able to communicate well, or his research well, but the special thing about Oppenheimer is that he went ahead and he tried very hard to learn his presentation skill. Here's his friend talking about him and his development of his speaking. He said, desperately eager to reach his students, his sensitivity sharpened by his own past difficulties. Oppenheimer made it a point to pay as much attention to the trouble of his charges as to the intricacies of his subject. His language evolved into an oddly eloquent mix of erudite phrases and pithy slang, and he learned to exploit the extraordinary talent for elucidating complex technical matters. He would take his very technical issue and he would use the very common language to explain it. He could explain it very simply. He didn't use the big vocabulary, and that was his power. That was his strength. That was his special ability. The result of his practice, later student found him the most stimulating lecture they had experienced. He became extremely popular as a result of his changing his style and structure. Here's a Nobel Prize winner about Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was uh, Hans Leth's teacher. He says, probably the most important ingredient Oppenheimer brought to his teaching was his exquisite taste. He always knew what were the important problems as shown in his choice of subjects. He truly lived with these problems, struggling for a solution, and he communicated his concern to the group. Here's another Nobel Prize winner on her teacher, Ludwig Boltzmann, who was the developer of the statistical treatment of atoms. She talked about Boltzmann at the end of her life. When she was retiring, she talked about the most important contributors to her thought. This is what she had to say. Boltzmann had no inhibitions whatsoever about showing his enthusiasm when he spoke. And this naturally carried his listeners along. He was fond of introducing remarks of an entirely personal character, so he would introduce personal things about himself, into his lecture. I particularly remember how, in describing the kinetic theory of gases, he told us how much difficulty and opposition he had encountered, because he had been convinced of the real existence of atoms, and how he had been attacked from the philosophical side without always understanding what the philosophers had against him. She remembers the story that Boltzmann told him. Here's another, uh, she says, Boltzmann was the most beautiful and stimulating thing I have ever heard. He was so enthusiastic about everything he taught us that no one left, that one left every lecture with the feeling of a completely new and wonderful world had been revealed. I already told you here about Eve Curry and her mother. This is her quote about her mother's continual shyness and how she was never able to get over it. Well, that's an introduction to researchers who have taken presentations seriously. Let's get practical for a moment. I want to introduce to you ten ways that you can gain more confidence, like Boltzmann, for your next conference presentation. And these have worked very well for my students, they've worked well for me, 
and I want to share them with you again as well. First, expect to be nervous. In fact, a little nervousness is good. If you have absolutely no nervousness, then you have no energy. So a bit of nervousness can it help actually make you a better speaker, as long as it doesn't overcome you, doesn't overpower you. Second, prepare. And when I say prepare, I mean don't write down every word that you're going to say and read it 500 times and put it in your mind exactly memorized. That is the recipe for disaster. <laughs> recipe for disaster. You know why? Because you have the whole thing in your mind, and what happens when you forget one word? It's all gone. It disappears. What happens when someone raises their hand? Question, all gone. <laughs> you don't have a way to bring it back. It's not safe. Have an outline. An outline are simple words, maybe letters, phrases that you can look at in an emergency and memorize the outline, five points, six points, and then have an example for each point or have key points under that, but keep those in your mind. Don't depend on a memorized speech. Also, it wastes a lot of time to write that kind of speech because you are wasting more time reading the speech than preparing the content for the speech. And it's not sustainable. You can't do this every time. You don't have time every time to memorize, especially a longer speech. Practice. Every chance you get, practice. And the example I'd like to give here is our American President, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, you know Lincoln? Yes. Most famous American president. If you ask 100 Americans, who is your favorite president, over 80% will say Lincoln. Washington, Jefferson, Kennedy, all the rest are 20. <laughs> it is like a god. We love Lincoln. He was our American president during the Second World War. We don't learn any other president's speech except his. We learn, we memorize Lincoln's speeches. We think he's our best public speaker. Now, Lincoln began with some very serious disadvantages, and his biggest disadvantage was the fact that he was born with a disease that made his bones very long. They kept going longer and longer, they were soft, and his rib cage actually would curl and made his lungs smaller. This is why he was so tall. This bone disease also made his body misshaped. One side of his face was much higher than the other. And when we see pictures of Lincoln today, the artist was being very kind. <laughs> because in reality, he was a very ugly man by all accounts. Now because his lungs were small, and because he couldn't stand straight, he had a very high voice, like a girl. Long, bony fingers. He was born in great poverty, a one-room house, dirt floor. His mother died when he was young, and he was a farm boy working in Illinois. But he decided at a young age he wanted to read, so he found an old copy of the Bible and taught himself to read by candlelight after work every night. He wanted to be a speaker, so he went to the local church and asked the musher, the minister, <laughs> if he could speak on Sundays. And the minister said, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good idea. And Lincoln said, please, let me do something. I want to practice my speaking. And finally the minister said, okay, you can read from the Bible. That seems safe. <laughs> so Lincoln came to church. He read from the Bible on Sunday in his high voice. And the people in the church told the minister, please don't do that. <laughs> I mean, one time is OK. Second time is just painful. <laughs> we can't take it. So Lincoln was kicked out of his job reading the Bible. So what was Lincoln going to do? He knew he needed to practice. But how can he practice with no people? He went back to his farm, and every night after work, he would practice his presentation to the corn. <laughs> you <and> me. <laughs> practice his presentation to the corn. If you were driving through American countryside a couple hundred years ago, and you heard a high voice coming from the corn, that was our future most famous American president practicing his presentation skill. Now, if Lincoln can do it, so can you. <laughs> You don't have corn in Taiwan. <laughs> but you have rice. I see rice everywhere. In Shinju, next to my house, there's like a little rice paddy, and I see the little guy with the cool hat working. 
you can use the, he will not mind. <laughs> not mind. You can practice your presentation skill to the right. Practice every chance you get. I remember when I first wanted to learn how to speak in public, I was in university. And every time the teacher would ask a question, I would force myself to raise my hand, even if I didn't know the answer, to practice my speaking. If the teacher wanted a volunteer to talk, I would volunteer. I, I put myself in a position where I had to talk. And of course, practice makes perfect, doesn't it? Practice makes perfect. Breathe from your stomach here, not from your throat. Push your diaphragm. This is a medical group. You know what that means. <laughs> Push it out. Focus on your uh, rehearse. Practice when you're in front of the mirror. Practice when you are driving your motorcycle. Don't practice on the motorcycle. That's dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. Practice when it's reasonable, with your friends, before you speak. Focus on your audience. Know what their level is. Have some information, not only for the specialist, but also the more general practitioner in your domain. Don't make him go to sleep wishing there was something for him. Make sure the introduction of the problem is something he understands. And then the implications and applications at the end apply to him. Now maybe in the middle you will lose him for a while, but at least at the beginning and the end, help him understand the problem and your solution and why it's important. Simplify. Remember, we don't want to impress people with our big vocabulary. We want to express our meaning. Another thing regarding English is really move your mouth a lot. <laughs> I get students who are always talking, they're, they're mumbling. Hello, my name is John. <laughs> Just, it's so hard to catch. If you're speaking English well, you should look a little bit ugly. <laughs> you should not be beautiful. Really move it. Every sound is important, particularly because English has so many, many words that sound similar, that if you say a word slightly different, it has an entirely different meaning. So make sure that you're really pronouncing clearly and carefully. <laughs> Picture success. You know, so many students before their conference presentation, they imagine everything that can go wrong. They think, I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to forget what to say, and someone will start laughing at me, and then someone will throw tomatoes at my head, and it will be a dis... But this thought is weakening them. This thought is taking away their confidence. We need to think positively. We need to imagine our crowd happy and enjoying what we say and listening and understanding, that thought is giving us more confidence. That thought is strengthening us. We practice here before we go and do it for real. Good example of this is uh, Tiger Woods, who's having some problems right now. <laughs> when you watch Tiger Woods play next time, watch him. He takes his golf club and he looks at the ball Looks at the whole. I, this speaker, for this subject. Those three links must be made. We get two things by doing that. Credibility and goodwill. Those are both vital. They have to think we can talk about it, and they have to like us. If they don't like us, even if we are right, they don't care. They ignore us. And at the same time, it's not enough to like us. We also have to believe that we know what we're talking about. That's why those three connections need to be made. Audience, speaker, and subject. And then, and this is probably the most important, <laughs> pretend to be confident. Ah, this helps students more than any other thing. I want to talk about this for a few minutes. Pretend to be confident. You know, there's an interesting connection between our mind <laughs> and our body, between our feeling and our action. Professor William James, 1893, Behavioral Modification Theory, still fundamental to psychology. Basically, what Professor James discovered is that we know my feeling will influence my action. For example, if I see a hungry bear, I will feel afraid, my body will shake, right? This is a connection. However, what Professor James discovered is that not only does the feeling influence the action, but by my action can also indirectly control my feeling. 
By controlling my action, I can change my feeling to match. We can pretend a 